an intermezzo we just wanted to do things a little differently but uh, we still stay with the traditional way uh, I'm really glad that the speaker made it in this weather from Missoula but I'm so glad that many people made it from around Butte and from Tech and uh, hopefully uh, at the end of the day we'll be all happy uh, so I really am happy to welcome Ben Coleman uh, from the University of Montana. Basically, our friendship with, uh, with uh, Ben just started a couple of months ago when uh, Scott contacted us, connected us, because it looks like we're going to supervise a student together, uh, and Scott will be also one of our speakers, so I don't want to tell all the things about his research. He will be performing in two or three weeks here, but before, now I'm just focusing on Ben, and before he starts his talk, uh, I need to, I would like to introduce him. So Ben Coleman grew up in upstate New York. He got his bachelor's in chemistry from Carleton College in Minnesota. Then worked as a technician for three years in Massachusetts, doing forest ecology research before going back to school. He got his PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara, in soil microbial ecology. Growing sick of the inter internally pleasant weather, he then went to North Carolina to work as a postdoc and later research scientist working in veterinary ecology and ecotoxicology. The University of Montana lured him away from the internally unpleasant weather of North Carolina and he joined the faculty in 2016 as an assistant professor of aquatic ecosystem ecology. So, that's a brief introduction of Ben, and uh, I'm really glad Great. to have you here in the program. Well, thank you. Thank you, Robert, for, for inviting me to come to speak to everybody, and thank you all for, for coming uh, to hear my talk today. And so the title of my talk is The Big Questions About the Role of Small Particles in Ecosystems. So part of this is going to be sort of a journey over the past seven or eight uh, years of my research. Um, before I get started, I want to thank a variety of folks who, who are collaborators on the work that I'm presenting to you today. So that includes folks from Duke, University of Kentucky, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Virginia Tech, Temple, East China Normal University, Baylor, and, and University of Waterloo up in Canada. Um, and I am an ecosystem ecologist, and probably many of you know what that is, but I, I want to just sort of give you my particular spin and, and a lot of, you know, a very quick overview of work that I've been doing um, to sort of set the context for the main part of my talk, talking about these small particles in ecosystems. And so I, you know, I think fundamental for understanding the practice of restoration is understanding how ecosystems work, and that is the discipline of ecosystems ecology in my mind, trying to understand how these systems work, the interplay between the biological and the abiotic components of these systems. And so I, I uh, spent a lot of time looking at terrestrial systems, looking at cycling of carbon and nitrogen in these systems, spent some time looking at uh, photochemistry in marine and freshwater systems, uh, interaction of organic matter and light, spent uh, a fair bit of time looking at riparian vegetation, wetland vegetation, and uh, interaction between that and the soils uh, that that vegetation was growing in, as well as trace gas fluxes in and out of those soils. Um, and really, the, the, the way that I think about sort of the, you know, the, the key questions that motivate the bulk of my research, the first one is, what are the drivers and mechanisms of element cycling? So I have here element X. It's a made-up element. But when I look at, at an ecosystem, I, I sort of think of it in terms of boxes and arrows. The boxes are, are pools of a given element, and the arrows are fluxes, or it can be physical movement between different pools, or it can be chemical transformation from one form to another. And, and so this is, this is my very boring way of seeing the world, but it works for me. It makes me happy, so I'll, I'll stick with it. The, the other motivating question in my research is what happens in, in these systems when there are chemical perturbations? How do these chemical perturbations change element cycling in, in the system? So represented by this red arrow coming in here and somehow affecting the pool or the fluxes. And so, uh, much of my work looking in terrestrial systems was looking at anthropogenically created nitrogen deposition on these systems, so either through fossil fuel combustion 
or through, uh, through fertilizer volatilization and then deposition. Uh, I've also worked some looking at the effects of saltwater intrusion into historically freshwater coastal wetlands. And then I also worked on one, which is, this is like the, 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 the record scratch, like what is going on, um, looking at nanoparticles. And so this is what I spent my postdoc focusing on. Uh, the EPA and NSF realized that there was an increasing number of products with, with uh, consumer products with nanoparticles, and they said, well, this may represent a new class of contaminant that we haven't thought about before. Let's put some money into sort of understanding what types of impacts they, these might have. Now, um, that sort of served as my entree into the world of the small particles, and so I'm going to, for the remainder of my talk, sort of talk about some lessons that came from, from that work, as well as highlight some fu future directions or, or ongoing directions in my work. So we'll, we'll focus on nanoparticles, but you may be wondering what are nanoparticles. And the quick answer is that nanoparticles are very small. They're in the one to 100 nanometer range. How small is that? It's about a billion times smaller than us. If you take something that's a billion times larger than any of us, that's Jupiter. So it's, it's a pretty large size differential. Um, and I also brought my uh, logarithmic meter stick here to give another sense of um, how big they are and put them in, in, in scale of objects that you maybe interact with more often than, say, Jupiter. Um, so we've got uh, nanoparticles down here at 1 to 100 nanometers. We have things like cobbles and gravel and sand and silt and clays. And it's only once we get down to clays, the small end of clays overlaps with nanoparticles. So these clays stacked up here, if you look at the at the, the, the uh, height of each of those sheets that's stacked up there, it's about a nanometer. Um, and, and really nanoparticles were sort of carved off of the bottom end of colloids for reasons that I'll get into in, in the next several slides. But the thing that I wanna highlight here is that um, in, in much of, of uh, science and monitoring uh, natural sciences, we, we have sort of this operational definition for what is dissolved. And the exact threshold varies by field. In much of uh, aquatic ecology, it's 0.7 microns or 700 nanometers. And the point I want to make here is that really a lot of what we think about as being operationally defined as dissolved may actually be particulate. And I'd like to explain why I think that is important. But that's just something to sort of keep in mind, that a large fraction of colloids, some clays, and uh, of course, all nanoparticles really, they, they are particulate in nature, but we might call them dissolved based on the fact that they can pass through these uh, filters. So why does this small size matter? Well, it matters for a, a range of reasons. One, if you look at something as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and this is true for people as well as particles, their surface area goes up relative to their volume. So you could have the same amount of material, uh, same, same mass of material, same volume if you squish it all together, but it's gonna have a lot more surface area. That higher surface area is gonna to lead to higher reactivity, faster reaction rates. The way I like to think of it is if you took, uh, if you took an Alka-Seltzer, and maybe some of you don't know what that is, it's a heartburn treatment. Um, you plop it in some water, it goes fizz, and then you drink it, and it helps to quiet your uh, upset stomach. Well, if you were to take that and crush it up and throw it in that water glass, it's going to spurt out the top. You're going to, it's going to have such a violent reaction because of all that surface area. So their small size presents a lot of surface area for interesting reactions to take place on. They also become more stable. So here we have uh, diameter again on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we have settling velocity. And so as particles get smaller and smaller and smaller, they settle much less rapidly. Well, what does this mean? Uh, what it basically means is that as particles get small, they're gonna start diffusing the Brownian motion, the drunken walk that you may have learned about in chemistry or um, heaven forbid you've ever experienced it firsthand, but the, um, these, these small particles will diffuse faster than they are settling, and so they'll stay, they'll remain stable in suspension for prolonged periods of time, or so they have that potential. And then finally, um, they are an efficient delivery system. So uh, for those of you who have, who have never seen the Trojan horse, this is a photograph that was taken of a replica because the story took place long, long ago. But the basic idea is 
uh, the, in order to get into the castle of the Trojans, this horse was constructed, soldiers were put in it, and it was given as a gift, but that gift contained a lethal payload. And so out piled the soldiers and um, on went the war. And so small particles can serve as a very efficient delivery system. So if you have a dissolved solid, you've got one atom bouncing around. If you have a particle that has 10,000 atoms, it's stable in solution, but it's moving a lot, or it's stable in suspension, moving a lot more slowly. Well, when an organism encounters that, there's a lot more of a potential chemical burden or potential resource that's coming into contact with that organism cell. And so it can be perhaps detrimental or perhaps beneficial to that organism if they can access um, those materials. And because of these unique properties that occur as sizes get smaller and smaller, there's been sort of this revolution in technology. And so by using carbon uh, in photovoltaic cells, we can create much more efficient uh, electrical generation from, from sunlight. By taking carbon nanotubes and turning them into thread, we can create something that has, the, that has as efficient or more efficient uh, conductivity of electricity than copper, but has the strength of steel. And it's made out of just carbon. Um, through incorporation of, of uh, either uh, manganese oxides or a variety of other uh, carbon nanomaterials into batteries, it's increased energy storage capacity. Uh, let's see, they've also used things like titanium dioxide to purify groundwater, so groundwater contaminated with inorganic contaminants, organic contaminants, or with, uh, with microorganisms by using sunlight to generate free radicals and oxidize, reduce, um, and, and otherwise destroy contaminants. It can purify groundwater, make it drinkable, make it usable. Um, these are quantum dots. They're all the same elemental composition, but by just changing the size, it changes the color of them. And so there are now uh, quantum dot televisions, quantum dot LEDs, which are way more efficient than any other kind of LED, more efficient than the organic LEDs and, and the more traditional LEDs. And it's all using technology, nanotechnology. And, and uh, then you can also have socks that uh, apparently glow. I can't. I can't confirm or deny whether they actually glow, but they are antimicrobial, and so your feet will never stink, if you believe the claims by the manufacturer, at least. So why, uh, you know, why might you want to get stuff with nanomaterials? I, you know, the, all, a whole bunch of good reasons, and so now we're up to probably about. 2,000 different consumer products with nanomaterials in them of all sorts and kinds. And in case you think that you probably don't have anything that has these nanomaterials, well, I would guarantee that you probably come, come in contact with stuff. In fact, the powdered donuts that got sent around, I would be, I am 95% sure that they have nanoscale titanium dioxide in them. They're delicious, I wouldn't worry about it, but they have nanoscale particles of titanium in them. Uh, skim milk used to be blue when I was a kid, now it's, it's white, miraculously white. Well, you take the colloids of fat out, you need to put something else in to scatter light. Um, very effective pigment in paint, Oreo cookies, uh, they use them in sunscreens, all sorts of electronics, the glowing socks, and waterproof coats from L.L. L. Bean. And so they're in a whole bunch of products. Why might, be, my, why might we be concerned? Well, we have a bad track record with emerging technologies. So here we have DDT. It smells sweet. It's an infective insect, a very effective insecticide. Uh, phosphate and detergents, chlorofluorocarbons in refrigerators. 20, 30 years down the line after adopting these technologies, we realized, oh, these have these kind of massive unanticipated consequences. So thinning of, of bird egg shells and, and, and uh, declines in some majorly important bird species, uh, decrease of, of nutrient limitation to algae and increase in frequency and, and magnitude of, of algal blooms. Um, Turns out chlorofluorocarbons totally inert in the, in, in the part of the atmosphere we live in, in the troposphere, but they get up into the stratosphere, and especially in the poles where you have some really unique um, mixed phase chemistry going on, all of a sudden it's a very efficient catalyst for chewing through ozone, and we end up with a, a hole in the ozone, more UV light getting in, and 
as much as I like UV light, that's maybe not necessarily a good thing. And so the question uh, that, that we were seeking to address when we began much of the work looking at, at the implications of nanotechnology for the environment is what happens when this stuff ends up out in the environment. And so sort of the three questions that we started with then are, are three questions that I, I still think are important. And, and so I'm going to um, walk through these over the course of the talk. And those three questions are, what are the sources of these different materials to uh, natural systems? How are they cycled? And how do they impact ecosystems? And the, it's to, to try and delve into that, I'm an ecosystem ecologist. And so I've, I've used a variety of different approaches, everything from sort of lab scale, bench top, single species in a tube, throw some nanoparticles in, see what happens, up to more complex systems. So here we have some, uh, some aquatic plants growing in water, but in the lab, here we have some uh, tubs of dirt, some small scale mesocosms, larger scale mesocosms. So mesocosm being a small scale encapsulation of the real world, but in, in sort of an experimentally tractable and contained fashion. And then up here we have, uh, uh, we did not do field scale additions, river scale additions, but we did look at an accidental release of materials into a river. So by looking across these scales, we can really sort of tease apart some of these interactions that we're interested in looking at. So what are the sources of these nanomaterials? There's three principal wide brush strokes uh, sources. One, we have human manufacturing processes. So uh, all that stuff I was talking about in the beginning, yeah, that, that's, that's what I mean here. We have biogeochemical processes, so by the interaction of water and uh, minerals, the biota, we have transformation and formation of a whole range of nanoscale particles. Your bodies make nanoparticles. Proteins uh, are considered in the nanoscale range and they behave like particles. Um, and then human altered biogeochemical processes. So you go and you fire up your diesel truck and out the tailpipe comes a range of aerosols including nanoscale particles. Um, you pile up a whole bunch of smelter slag and out comes all of this, all of these metals, many of which are at least at some point during their transformation process existing at this nanoscale. And so, um, so I'll refer to these as natural nanoparticles, incidental nanoparticles. So we weren't creating them on purpose, but we did create them um, or lead to their creation. And then manufactured particles. And something that's important to keep in mind is, is much of, of the work that I have been involved in is really focused at these manufactured particles. But in reality, they're, they're a small slice of the pie. There's a lot more in the way of incidental and natural particles in most systems than you're ever gonna see of these manufactured particles. So that's something also to keep in mind. And it's been a motivation as my work has progressed to, to start thinking more about the incidental and natural particles. So just a few examples of some of these different natural iron nanomaterials. So here we have uh, sort of this rainbow iridescent iron slick. Uh, this is in a, in a stream in West Virginia. This is in one of our wetland mesocosms. So what happens is iron gets reduced in the sediments. Uh, and then in the presence of oxygen and certain microorganisms, that iron gets transformed. It gets oxidized uh, at a rate much more rapidly than without the microorganisms. And so here we have, this is a bacterial cell, uh, sort of sliced, uh, um, what's that, longitudinally? No, latitudinally, across its midsection. Here we have some uh, cut longitudinally. And so these, these microorganisms are oxidizing the iron, depositing it as ferrohydrite crystals. So these are iron oxyhydroxide nanoscale minerals, depositing it on the sheath that they then live in. It's kind of amazing, and, and so that, that's what you're seeing when you see these iron-rich slicks. It almost looks like someone spilled oil, but if you blow on it or touch it, it's kind of platy on the margins instead of sort of uh, creating more rounded margins and then re-connecting um, with itself. Um, so that's, that's just one example. Here's an example that was a bit of a surprise to us. So we were doing an experiment with alfalfa with silver sulfide nanoparticles. And we were looking, we looked at this TEM image and we're like, oh, there they are, great. These are the same size as what we added, there you go. And what we found is that these were actually silicon nanoparticles and we found them in, in, in our controls where we hadn't added silver sulfide nanoparticles, 
but they were very well dispersed. In the presence of the silver sulfide nanoparticles, the silver was uh, highly associated with this silica coating around it. These sil silica particles had sort of aggregated around it. And we hypothesize, we don't have any strong evidence for this, but it's an intriguing idea at least, that the plants are actually in part using silica to sort of detoxify these metals by enclosing them in glass, if you will. Not quite, it's crystalline, but still, same general idea. Um, another example and another surprise, we were looking for uh, gold nanoparticles and silver nanoparticles that we'd exposed to this aquatic plant, Egeria densa. It's a non-native invasive, but it's very common, especially in parts of the southeastern U.S. And so here is a close-up of one of the leaves from one of these plants. There's a little box here that you can't probably quite make out, but when we zoom in on this area here, here we have an X, uh, XY scan, and then here we have an XZ, so this is depth looking into the leaf. You see a whole bunch of green, and maybe you can see some red. There's a little red there, and then there's sort of a, a grouping of red here. The green is from chlorophyll, autofluorescence of the chlorophyll. The red, these are small particles that are sort of buried within the structure of the leaf, buried in between mesophyll elements, and we're like, ah, we must have found our gold and our silver, and we were dead wrong. It was titanium dioxide that came from the soil. The soils, most soils, surface soils, around 1% titanium dioxide. It's a, a very broad average, but certainly in North Carolina, that's, that's, that's about right. And for whatever reason, this titanium dioxide has ended up within the cell, cellular structure and in between the cells of these plants. Moving on to incidental nanomaterials, uh, here we have an example from the Dan River coal ash spill. So this is back in 2000 and, and 2014, I believe, is when the spill occurred. And the, um, in North Carolina, our coal-fired power plants are a, a, a major source of energy. We don't have quite the hydropower that you do in the, in the state of Montana. And they're all located adjacent to water bodies, typically mostly rivers. And they all have these coal ash uh, impoundments, typically unlined, right adjacent to the river. And what happened is there was a culvert going under this one. That culvert rotted through, uh, and 29 million gallons of coal ash uh, and coal ash, um, the overlying water, flushed out in the river. So here you can see that plume coming down the river. And so um, working with a, a local nonprofit, we went out and we sampled and we looked at, all right, what's the distribution of elements, either elements that we would expect in coal ash, things that we might not expect in coal ash, what might we see? And we saw a variety of things, but two I'd like to highlight. The first one is we saw, again, this is electron microscopy, we saw these titanium dioxide particles. We could tell by looking at the, at the crystal structure and the, and the spacing um, that these were titanium dioxide but they were associated with copper. So this is a map of copper, a heat map of copper. And so the, the copper seemed to be absorbing onto the surface of the titanium dioxide. Another thing that we found, this was just upstream. This was an illicit uh, outfall, not a permanent discharge for these, uh, for these coal ash ponds. But you, you see the, the orange on the rocks. Anytime you see that kind of a color, it, it screams of iron probably iron uh, oxyhydroxide. And sure enough, when we collected some of the water that was coming out, and you can see some of the water coming through, it was just chock full of, of, of particulate matter. And a lot of it was these small uh, aggregates of iron oxyhydroxide or ferrihydrite particles, and those were just coated with arsenic. The arsenic concentrations for perspective coming out of here, the lowest we saw was around 200 micrograms per liter which if you uh, consider that the, the safe drinking water guideline the, uh, that's been established is 10 micrograms per liter, this is 20 fold over that, um, that amount. So pretty sizable amounts of arsenic coming out and it's not in a dissolved form, it's absorbed on these particles. And so you can imagine in terms of the interaction of the biota with those particles, it's gonna be fundamentally different than if it was a dissolved solute that was flowing through in the river. Now moving from incidental to manufactured particles, the big three in terms of the volume that's produced in terms of the number of products that, are, uh, that use these are titanium dioxide, zinc oxide, and silver. And really for a lot of the work that I, I did 
in terms of looking at these manufactured particles, the main focus was on silver. Why silver? Well, silver is used as a biocide. It's been used as a biocide for thousands of years. So that seemed like a good reason to use it. And, and you know, if you look through the literature, whether you're an algal cell or a plant or microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, invertebrates, invertebrates, regardless of where on the tree of life you are, silver can cause toxicity and death. So using something that's a biocide, if what we're concerned about is, you know, what kinds of effects might these things have, it seemed like a logical place to start. In terms of how these different uh, manufactured materials are likely to enter the environment, they are likely to do it by way of wastewater. So uh, as you wash your socks, the first wash, I think something like 50% of the silver nanoparticles come off the socks, goes down the drain, and ends up in a wastewater treatment plant. And as it moves through the wastewater treatment plant, um, it's, it's going to tend to become a sol some fraction is going to uh, be associated with the biosolids. And in the US, a majority of our biosolids that we produce are field applied. And, and then an, a smaller fraction, on, on, you know, and it depends on what sort of a system you're looking at, but on the order of 1 to 10% of the materials that's coming through the wastewater treatment plant is likely released as effluent. But of course, biosolids uh, being land applied doesn't mean they're going to stay there. So due to erosive fluxes, some fraction of that is likely to move into aquatic systems. And when we started this work, we talked a lot with our engineering colleagues. And they said, ah, what's going to happen is you're going to put the stuff in a natural system. It's going to aggregate and be completely removed. And so we're like, all right, well, let's, let's test this out. And, we didn't have our mesocosm set up, so we did some small uh, in-lab assays with just a natural assemblage of, of stream microorganisms, some stream water. We put the particles in, and sure enough, we saw aggregates. So all these arrows are pointing to darker areas on this micrograph. Those darker areas are, are, are aggregates of these silver nanoparticles. The white spots are bacteria. So we used a DNA intercalating stain. It lit them up like Christmas. And uh, the thing that was hilarious is that the, they're growing right on these aggregates. They were, if you invert the bottle that this was sitting in, you'd see these streamers of organic, of, of extracellular polysaccharides, this goo that microbes exude, coming off of these particle aggregates. So apparently, uh, in a natural system, indeed, they do uh, tend to aggregate. And the microbes didn't seem to mind them too terribly much. So we said, all right, well, OK, we know what's going to happen when we do a, a mesocosm experiment. We're scaling up, but we're going to do it anyways because you know what? <coughs> we kind of have to. We, we need to know what's going to happen for sure. So uh, this is our wetland mesocosm setup. So it has this, uh, it's about 4 foot by 12 foot by 3 or 4 feet deep. It goes from an aquatic, permanently flooded aquatic component uh, up to sort of this transitional zone that is periodically inundated with water depending on rainfall and evapotranspiration. And then this upland compartment that rarely, during most years, is inundated with water. And we said, all right, what's going to happen? And just using a super coarse metric, so remember how I was talking about these 700 nanometer uh, filters as our coarse metric of dissolve versus not dissolve. Well, we knew full well that the majority of the nanoparticles should go right through that. And we said, all right, if they aggregate to a significant extent, we're going to pick it up with this. So let's see what happens. And, you know, I mean, we could, you could see them in our in-lab assay, so it wasn't unreasonable to expect that this might work. So we added um, three different forms of silver. So we added two different silver nanoparticles, the, the squares and the triangles. We added silver in a dissolved form, silver nitrate. And we looked to see what happened. And so over time, this is going from the beginning of the experiment down to the end of the experiment. You can see that things fall out on this one-to-one -one line of unfiltered silver versus filtered silver. So suggesting that if they were aggregating, they weren't aggregating appreciably much, you know, not enough to catch it in this. But we wanted to look at a little bit more fine scale and try and reconcile our two experiments. So we did a microcosm experiment with plants, without plants. Um, so this, the idea being that maybe the plants are stabilizing things. And in fact, we did see this large release of organic matter. Organic matter can stabilize colloidal and nanoscale particles. 
perhaps that's what's going on. And sure enough, with plants, we saw the same sort of pattern that we saw in our mesocosm experiment without any plants. We saw we, we lost about 40% just after 24 hours, 40% of the silver had grown to the point that it was large enough that uh, it wasn't making it through these filters. But we wanted to look a little bit more, in a little bit more nuanced way and say, all right, but what's happening to the distribution of these particle sizes? So we started with something that was around, so on this x-axis here we have both retention time and size. This is a technique called field flow fractionation. Um, and to make it even worse, it was asymmetrical flow, field flow fractionation. Um, a little bit more of a mouthful. But if you look, uh, at the particle size, which is, a, you know, it's, it's a particle chromatography technique, the, the size of the particles when there were plants present were about on par with our stock. They weren't significantly different from the stock in terms of the, the, the particle size. What about the ones without any plants added? Well, they're sort of buried under here, so you can see it up here. Without the plants, they're much larger, so coming in at about 150 nanometers. So this is, again, after a short period of time, they'd aggregated to that extent and not a whole lot larger. We also saw much lower mass total, so it could be that um, I should mention that we do a one micron filter before putting things into the, uh, the FFF apparatus, and so we probably also lost quite a bit due to that pre-filtration because it had aggregated. We knew it was bigger than 700 nanometers, so it was probably even larger. So even what, is, what remains is still fairly large. Um, another lesson in terms of how these things move through ecosystems, how they are, are cycled, um, not totally surprisingly, I, I never thought I was going to study the biogeochemistry of silver, but it, it's not unlike other metals. Um, we see oxidation of, of this metallic zero, so zero valent silver. Uh, we see oxidation, production of dissolved silver. We see sulfidation, so you may be familiar with this as tarnishing. Um, the silver reacted with sulfide, which given that this was in a wetland environment, totally, totally expected that we would see some. And that tends to make it less reactive, less soluble, and less toxic. We also found evidence of uh, binding to thiol groups. So uh, when you have a sulfur stuck on uh, organic, that's a thiol group. And these tend to bind very strongly with metal cations, and sure enough, silver was no different. We found evidence of both formation de novo of silver nanoparticles from additions of dissolved silver. So a variety of, of factors can interact with light to form particles. I mean, that is sort of the basis of, of, of much of, um, of early photography before you could take pictures with your phone. And so it's not totally surprising, but still, we, we didn't totally expect it. Um, we also saw a formation of silver sulfide nanoparticles from dissolved silver. We saw oxidation of silver sulfide particles and release, release of dissolved silver. And then finally, um, in a biosolid uh, terrestrial mesocosm experiment, we found these titanium dioxide particles that were coated with silver. So again, we see this metal cation, possibly through photoreduction, uh, coating these titanium oxide or metal oxide particles. In terms of impacts of man manufactured particles, I could give a whole talk on that, but um, apparently I'm not allowed to talk for two hours. So I'll, I'll give you the very quick version and hit on something that then leads into where my research is going. Um, it's important to think about this, you know, if, if w when I came into this, the bulk of the literature was all focused on toxicity to single organisms or strains of organisms, um, no genetic diversity or very little. And even today, that's still by and large the, the major focus, but really what I was interested in doing and what we were doing as, as part of this uh, research center that I was a part of was looking at organisms, looking at them in the context of populations, so like organisms all living together, looking at their interactions with other members of the community, so different, um, different tax of organisms interacting, eating each other and, and whatnot, um, and then looking at, at how that then interacts with the abiotic components of the ecosystem and how that all interacts. And one of the things that uh, was in some ways surprising, but you know, now looking at the literature, it's not at all surprising, is we saw uptake of these particles. So, uh, a colleague of mine said, 
that's really weird. That's like, that's like me trying to swallow a basketball. How does that even get in there? You know, if you look at nanopores, they're too small. Um, there's been a lot of work on mechanism, um, but it, it does seem that for a lot of these particles, they can be taken up intact. Um, so here we have a heat map. This was uh, some work that we did using micro X-ray fluorescence uh, microscopy. So the heat map is proportional to the amount of silver in these plant roots of this duckweed, uh, Landoltia punctata. And sure enough, we see the highest concentrations are, are sort of in the, in, the, in the core of the roots here. And we added silver nanoparticles, silver sulfide nanoparticles, again, silver sulfide much less readily uh, dissolved. And so we would expect that if it's taken up, it's likely gonna be taken up as silver sulfide. Silver, uh, zero, it can be oxidized, dissolved, taken up as dissolved. And what we found is that really, for the most part, the major forms of silver that we found within the, the roots were the forms in which we added it. There was some transformation, some transformation even of the silver sulfide, but largely we found that which we added. Um, in terms of looking at movement of these through the food web, here's one example from our uh, wetland mesocosms. And so on the left, uh, on the y-axis, we have silver concentration. We have primary producers, filter grazers, detritivores, predators, and then a, a terrestrial predator uh, or weaver spider. And what we found was that we see highest concentrations in the primary producers and the sort of primary consumers that are eating these, either when they're alive or when they're dead. We see lower concentrations in the predators, um, be they aquatic or terrestrial. So the terrestrial predators are catching the emerging uh, benthic macroinvertebrates, the, the mayflies and the stoneflies, well, no stoneflies here, but the dragonflies, the damselflies, the chironomids, all these little insects that are coming out of the, the uh, aquatic compartment are then getting nailed by the orb weavers, which have the webs right overwards. And so we're seeing transfer from the aquatic to the terrestrial, but it seems rather than seeing sort of biomagnification, higher concentrations as you go up, food web, uh, up the food web, uh, we see perhaps some evidence of biodilution. And this was in a, a year-long study, and it seemed to be pretty constant throughout that year-long study. So in terms of the work that I'm, I'm doing at, at UM, um, you know, I'm interested broadly in, in the role of these particles in ecosystems. And again, we do see bioaccumulation. So these, these concentrations here, the concentration in which uh, it's found in the water column is orders of magnitude between three and, and five orders of magnitude at times, not, not in this figure here, but um, in some of the other time periods, we saw five orders of magnitude difference in terms of the concentration of the organisms as opposed to what's in the water column. So we do see bioaccumulation, at least at the lowest of trophic levels. Um, and that's with these manufactured nanomaterials, which we're adding at, at, at fairly low concentrations. But again, these natural and incidental particles are much, lar much larger, way larger, incredibly larger concentrations of these in these aquatic systems, in terrestrial systems as well. And this is things ranging from cloud aerosols, clays, iron and aluminum oxides, proteins and, and natural organic matter, uh, vol volcanic ash, mineral composites, black carbon and fullerenes from created in, in wildfire, as well as these iron slicks I talked about before. And so you know, the direction that I'm moving in my research going forward is trying to say, all right, well, what role do these play? Some of these which may contain things that are nutrients that organisms might like to access. And if organisms are taking up these small particles, maybe they can. And so there's a few different projects that I'm working on getting off the ground. They're in various stages of, of, um, of of taking flight, but one is, is trying to look at particles across flow paths. So leading from soils into groundwater, from groundwater into the streams, what role is, is transfer of these, what we would traditionally call dissolved solutes, what role is the transport of particulates playing in, uh, in connecting these systems? And so this is looking at, at, at colloids and nanoparticles, looking at things like, which carbon's not really a nutrient, but please give me this one uh, mistake here, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, these elements that ecosystem colleges typically really think about a lot, but also things like iron, manganese, silica, aluminum, calcium, magnesium, um, things that people spend a little less time in ecosystem ecology thinking about. Um, 
Also, I'm interested in looking at, at these small particles as potential contaminant vectors, so especially in, say, um, systems that have been subjected to a history of mining and smelting and deposition of, of, um, uh, of overburden and whatnot. Um, and, and here the question is very similar, a similar question but a very different system. What fraction of these contaminants are moving through the system in a particular fraction and how does this alter their transport, uptake, and biomagnification as opposed to if they were dissolved? And so this is work by a soon-to-be master student in my lab uh, that, that we're going to start this summer. Uh, looking out in the Clark Fork, and there's already been a, a lot of really good work out there characterizing diel movements between particles and dissolved forms, and we're hoping to apply some of these techniques that, that I described earlier to try and tease apart that story a little bit more. Uh, and also look at the interaction of the biota with these small particles. And then also <clears throat> another student uh, that's currently working in my lab, Lauren Sullivan, is going to be looking at nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and metals in wastewater lagoons and looking at, at what fractions they're associated with. So in Montana, there's about 90, roughly 90, wastewater lagoons that are used as the, the wastewater treatment for small municipalities, typically. And so the question is, all right, well, you know, many of these are having exceedances, and if we look at this from the perspective of um, you know, what fractions are these metals associating with and what fractions are these nutrients associated with, maybe that can alter how we try and upgrade these plants given limited budgets to try and increase their efficiency. <clears throat> and then the final thing that I, I want to talk about is biological uptake and use. So I, I gave you several examples of uptake of, of things that we wouldn't expect plants or animals to use, silver, titanium dioxide, but there's also a lot of things out there that are things that plants and animals and microorganisms would love to get their enzymes on or what have you. And, and, and so the way that I think about it in, in terms of the transformation of my thought process is that when I was in graduate school with Josh Schimmel, uh, there had been a lot of work showing that you know, this historic way of viewing nitrogen uptake by plants, you know, plants are taking up these dissolved solutes, ammonium and nitrate, and that's it and they just get the, the, the leftovers from the microorganisms, well, that's actually missing a pool of nitrogen that plants can take up. So as soil organic matter breaks down, creates amino acids and other very labile substrates, and there were a variety of studies that have shown, well, actually, plants are competing for that, and that's why in some studies, if you just look at these, your, your fluxes into the plants aren't matching what they should be to get you, get you this pool of nitrogen that you have in the plants. Well, I think that the same idea can be applied to looking at these, these nanomaterials. So here we have the silica in, in alfalfa, titanium dioxide in Nigeria, but also looking at things like iron, looking at phosphorus absorbed on iron. What role might these be playing in the mineral nutrition of plants? Um, and so one example, um, if it was a little darker, you'd be able to see this deep red. Oh, thank you. I don't know if that'll do it. I think I might even need to shut the windows. It's all right. It's red soil. If you've ever seen pictures of the tropics, um, you've seen these beautiful red soils. Ah, it's okay. I, it, Google tropical soils, you'll spend hours looking at them. They're fascinating. So you've got these, these, these small particles of iron and alumina uh, intermixed, and they are strongly absorbing phosphorus and limiting phosphorus availability, but yet plants grow and they grow big and tall. And if we look at the availability of phosphorus in the soils, it doesn't seem to match up with how much the, the plants are getting. So one thought that I've had is that if plants are able to take up in sort of these variable redox conditions, if they're taking up uh, or even leading to the transport of these uh, iron bound or phosphorus bound on iron, then it may be another source of phosphorus that the plants have available to them. And I think given the similarities of arsenic to phosphorus, this might also be a factor in arsenic contaminate, contaminated landscapes. So here we have up in the Smelter uh, Hills area, this is a picture of that Scott Robinson. Uh, Scott Robinson, who's sitting among you, who's giving a talk on March 29th, shameless plug. Um, it's a picture that Scott took. But you know, the, the arsenic concentrations are incredibly high up there. Vegetation in part may be limited in terms of its growth by arsenic and other metals. And it may be that some of the uptake is taking place as uptake of arsenic that is absorbed on particle surfaces. 
And so, you know, if, if this process is important, I would be very surprised if this one is not. So, if there's one thing you take away from today's talk, um, I hope that it is that the operational definition that is commonly used for talking about things that are dissolved, um, it completely ignores these small particles. So if we peel back this dissolved moniker here, we see we've got colloids, nanoparticles, clays, much of clays fall into that range. And because of their potential stability, because of their potential high reactivity, and because of the fact that they can carry a payload with them, either the payload being themselves or stuff stuck on the outside, that it could be pretty interesting to focus in and focus down on what role these are having in ecosystems. And so in particular, I, I am uh, hypothesizing some of these, I've got more evidence than others that, that they are important roles, but I'm, I'm suggesting that small particles play many roles beyond what we're used to thinking of when we think of, say, clays and soils, holding onto nutrients, holding onto water, holding onto organic matter. And so, the, you know, contaminants is, is certainly one potential role. Um, looking along flow paths as ways of connecting upland systems with aquatic systems in terms of serving as contaminant vectors and then finally in terms of biological uptake and potentially use. Um, you know, is there a reason that these plants have taken up this titanium dioxide? Who knows? It's hard to reason with a plant. I have no idea. But perhaps it's serving some role. Perhaps it's, you know, the, these are white pigments. Perhaps it is helping to harvest more light, or perhaps it's playing some other role. So anyways, that's where I'd like to leave it, and I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
like ever since products were made. It's just that nobody counted that or measured it in the, I, you know, talcum powder, or, you know, milk. I mean, all these things have nanoparticles in it just because in many cases they came that way from the natural world where the products come from or they're produced in the manufacturing world. Um, and so there's a huge history of working with products with the nanoparticles in it. I was wondering if there's any particular evidence of the particular impacts that the nanoparticles have, given that you can't just draw a line in time and say, okay, before 2005 there were none of them and now we have them, as opposed to the, so the, the chemistry, the bigger the particle is, the more it has the chemistry of whatever it's made out of. But it, it's a nanoparticle, it's like it in quantum mechanics too, and the chemistry kind of disappears there. Yeah, and you, you yield to almost religion, right? right. Spirituality. <laughs> No, no. I, I mean, I think I, I think I understand what you're saying, and 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 unfortunately, my answer is, I don't know. I mean, certainly, yes. That that is a very you know, those are our products that have been recorded in the registry. Um, I do think that compared to the 2,000 or so products that are out there now, it's that with many of those intentionally putting nanomaterials in for their unique properties and presenting them in the product in a way so that they may very well be lost from that product into, into natural systems directly or indirectly. There's certainly a lot more now than there used to be. Um, and I would say certainly in the manufacture of these materials, you know, I showed you just the number of products. It's roughly linear, but that doesn't actually reflect the masses that are being used. It's exponential. I mean, it's, it's grown to be a huge, so I, I think I think your point is 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 a very good one. It, these aren't new products. People have been using. Uh, the milk has had coloring in it since before 2005. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Titanium uh, food grade titanium dioxide has been used for a long time. Yeah, and for both of those, it's it's um, it's food grade titanium dioxide. It's in toothpaste as well. Um, and yeah, that's been around for a very, very long time. It's been used, titanium dioxide has been used in paint for a long time. Um, I do think that there has been a shift um, in, in that sector. And so there is a lot more mass of these materials being produced and used. Uh, I would say it, I don't have the exact numbers, but I think it dwarfs the food scale titanium dioxide to just choose that one example. But no, it's a very good point. And I don't know about sort of longitudinal studies um, in terms of human health, looking at uh, human health, I, I, I try. Ecosystem milk, but then also the biocidal effects of silver is not a nanoparticle effect. It's a silver effect. It depends, it depends. So if you have these, if you, if you were to look in at the particle, what you have is this particle that contains a very high concentration of silver. It's all silver. And then on the outside of that, you have sort of chemisorbed on it, you have these silver ions. And yes, it's the silver ions that are having the toxic effects. The silver nanoparticle is the delivery system. So it's sort of that Trojan horse, except the, 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 the little soldiers are the same thing as the horse itself. Um, and yeah, I mean, it is, it is a silver, but it's not just dissolved silver. If you look at dissolved silver concentrations in an experiment, you do the same experiment with the same organism with that same concentration, oftentimes you won't see the same effect because they're not getting the same exposure as they would with this particle sitting on their cells. But that's, yeah, it's, it's not all happening at the nanoscale, but the particles are involved. What are the practical effects among regulatory agencies when they ignore this operation definition or use this operation definition that ignores these particles. In terms of uh, effective uh, identification of potential toxicity and things like this. That is a very good question. Um, and I don't have a simple answer for it. Um, and I would have to think about it a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, do, do you have an answer? Are you going to bail me out? Roughly. No, very vaguely, roughly. Yeah. Uh, if you look at water quality standards for the state of Montana, 
it's based on something called total recoverable. And the difference between total recoverable and dissolved is 0.45 microns. But um, the state, so the feds have gone to looking at truly dissolved as affecting the body odor. But the state stayed with total recoverable because it's sort of your Trojan horse effect. So what happens if a particle is moving, in the case of the Clark Fork, a lot of copper along, where does that go in the environment? And does it have an effect there? I don't know if that. Yeah, and, and yeah, the, and, 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 and I think, you know, the times that I've run into this the most, so for example, the Dan River coal ash spill, you know, if, if you know, there, a lot, of it, a lot of the arsenic coming out um, uh, from that illicit discharge in particular was associated with these iron nanoparticles. Those iron nanoparticles, though, were bound up in this matrix from the, from the iron oxidizing microbes. And so they, if put through a filter, they would have been retained. But I would argue that their persistence in the environment is not going to be as these big aggregates. They're going to become disaggregated. And, and so I think it is important to think of total recoverable as opposed to just focusing on dissolved. And we actually got into a pretty spirited debate with another researcher from Duke University who said, the concentrations you guys are talking about are just kooky because, you know, in reality, what's important is this dissolved fraction. It's like, well, you know, it's, it's yes and no. And it may be that what you're seeing coming out of a discharge like that compared to how it's going to be transformed as it goes down the river, it might be that those big aggregates become disaggregated and then they would fall into that dissolved purview, but they haven't really chemically changed. And so we were saying, well, actually the total is what the, I believe what the Clean Water Act is based on. And so that seems like a logical one to go for and then you don't have this operational definition getting in the way. But that's not, uh, kind of a non-answer. <laughs> An anecdote. How did they mitigate the damage at the Dam River? Uh, so I think um, they did uh, about, they recovered about, I don't know what the latest is, one to three percent of what was released. And then the rest of it just disappeared. <laughs> yeah. That's what I thought. Yep. I, I think it's in Car Lake, which is the water body just downstream. So, so what is the size of, say, a, a zinc ion? How does it fit into this scale? More angstrom scale, so an order of magnitude smaller than the smallest end of, of nanoparticles. Yeah, so... So saying 0.45 doesn't get even close to No. That. No, you know, some people use um, 20 nanometer or thereabouts, and there a lot of the, the small particles will be retained on that, even, even particles smaller than 20 nanometers, because they have sort of this corona of proteins and organic matter around them that uh, helps them be retained. Um, but yeah, smaller. We, we use the cutoff as about one nanometer, or if you're a fan of Dalton's, a thousand kilodaltons is right around one nanometer. Right around. Hand waving. Thank you, man. All right. Well, thank you all.